life-saving artistic activism. Artists like the way to a living future. My name is Rebecca Sonia, and I'm an activist with Families for Safe Streets. And I'm honored to be your moderator today. And up here with our usual level of guests, one of my panelists, Jack Lowry, is the author of It Was Vulgar and It Was Beautiful, How Age Activists Use Art to Fight a Pandemic, a New York Times Book Review Editor's Book. His writing has appeared in the Atlantic, the Times Literary Supplement, and the All. And as an editor, he has published the poetry of David Wojnarowicz. Steve Lambert is the founder and artistic director of the Center for Artistic Activism, a research and training institute in New York helping activists to be more creative and artists to be more effective. Last year, Lambert published with Steve Duncan, The Art of Activism, your all artist guide to making the impossible possible. He's an associate professor of new media studies at SUNY Purchase. Is everything okay? <laughs> Jorge Canez, a.k.a. Kiato Nito, is the Cage Crusader for Pedestrian Rights out of Mexico City and Los Angeles. As Kiato Nito, he has been featured in the Wall Street Journal and on ABC News and on the BBC. And in 2020, Jorge earned his Master's in Urban Planning through UCLA. He now works as a road safety consultant and a pedestrian advocate. As for me, I'm an activist with Families for Safe Streets in memory of my brother, Paul Sankin. So I'd like to take just a moment to lay out how our time will be allocated today. In the first half of our program, our panelists will mostly be in conversation with one another. I'll pose the occasional question. And then we're going to turn the floor over to all of you as Steve Lambert leads us through the interactive portion of our panel. So to get started, I thought we could all get on the same page and define our long term of artistic activism. So, Jeff, we're going to start with you. Okay. You wrote the book on Grand Fury, one of the most successful crews of artistic activists of all time. What is artistic activism, and what makes it such an effective means of protest and persuasion and change? Well, I think the thing that I like about artistic activism is that it kind of like resists like an easy like definition or a container. Like in the case of Grand Fury, like it looks like posters, billboards, um, you know, signs on bus shelters. It was you know TV advertising. It was so many things. Obviously, you know. I, the time period that I was writing about was, you know, 1987 to 1993. So, so much has changed in, you know, those years in terms of possibilities for artistic activism, um, and obviously it looks very different today. But I think that your the second question that you're asking, Rebecca, is something that I really do feel like is like very easily quantifiable, or at least in the way that I see it. One of the things that I think that artistic activism can really do is that it can get people to really change their mind about something or to kind of precipitate a very like, particular mindset shift. Um, one, of the, it was one of my favorite Grand Fury posters, um, and this was sort of playing in the slideshow, it reads, all people with AIDS are innocent. Um, and this poster was in, made in response to something that conservative politicians would often say during the AIDS crisis, of certain people, um, hemophiliacs and children were AIDS, with AIDS were often called AIDS, quote, most innocent victims. And if you think about what that term means, it delineates a kind of hierarchy of, like, who deserves AIDS versus, like, who doesn't. And so this poster, All People With AIDS Are Innocent, is a, trying to kind of collapse that hierarchy. And to say, like, nobody deserves to be living with AIDS. Like, nobody, like, no matter what you did, like, nobody deserves this illness, where there's no guilt in having this illness. And that kind of mindset shift that they're trying, that Grant was trying to um, sort of precipitate or enact with the general public, it, that may seem like a very sort of slight shift, but it has very big impacts and it has very tangible impacts. If you think about the kind of medical care that you give to somebody who you think is deserving of an illness versus somebody who you think is not deserving of an illness, that's very, very different. Um, or if you think about, you know, how you know, the federal government approaches a problem when they think of this group of people as deserve, being deserving of their circumstances, Versus when they see their, you know, this illness is not having a kind of moral or a moral dimension to it, um, and so I think that that's the, the real big potential for artistic activism in all fields is to kind of get people to approach issues in different ways um, and to try and get to them to think about those issues differently. Steve, I want to jump off of something that, that Jack said that 
he covered the period, I think you said from 1979 to now. 1987 to 1993. Okay, totally botched the year. So from 1987 <laughs> to 1993, we also said that the possibilities have changed. Yes. Do, do you see any, what, what, what are some of the newer possibilities from what Grant Furrier is doing, which is, you know, what we think of now as a paranormal era? Mm-hmm. And then into now, which is, uh, you know, a much more digital. Yeah, well, here's the format it takes, right? So, I mean, when we think about art, we often think about mediums. So, you know, sculpture, painting, photography. Um, but there's also the process that goes into it, right, of, like, being experimental and, like, testing things out. And that's often... The add degrees in art, and like that's what you learn in school, but often people don't see. People see the last thing, you know, they see the movie at the premiere, or they see the thing at the museum, the curtain is raised, and it's completely done. Mm-hmm. And it's perfect, right? Um, and, but there's like a creative process that goes into that. And in activism, activism that's often forgotten because we only see the final picture, right? Mm-hmm. So the really famous images of the civil rights movement, you know, we see the black and white photos of people with their arms linked marching down the street or, you know, sitting at the lunch counter, and it's like, okay, that's what a protest is, and we're going to try to recreate that photo instead of recreating the process that led to that action, right, which was, like, very uh, strategic, thinking about the images that they wanted to create and the, the effect those images would have. So, um, so there's all the formats, right, that it can take, which are, it's so much easier to make this kind of stuff now or, like, find people to make uh, the imagery, but the, the core part of it, which is like the th- thinking behind it and the creativity and the innovation that goes into creating tactics, that has not changed. And it's, um, I'm afraid to say it might have gotten worse, you know, because there's so many uh, images to draw on now to recreate. Um, so there's, you know, there's, I think it's why the, our organization sort of came to exist, it's like, hey, we need to keep up here. We need, the law enforcement is very creative, and we need to be just as creative, or, you know, politicians are incredibly creative and innovative. It's very different how they target people, you know, so, like, how has, how have these movements changed, and bringing some of that into, um, into that behind-the-scenes work. So I'd like to say, oh, sorry, go ahead. Yeah. Oh, I was just going to jump in and say, like, one of the things that what you're saying is kind of reminding me of Steve is like the possibilities of activism that used to be possible that aren't possible anymore today. Like one of the things that was really like I was born in 1993, so I was not alive during the Vietnam. <laughs> there we go. Um, I was not alive during the events that I was writing about. But one of the things that I found most striking was the way in which, um, like, like post 9/11 security measures have like totally changed the landscape of like what activists avenues or what activist tactics are possible. Yeah. If my book opens with, you know, the story of ACT UP, like, breaking into the New York Stock Exchange to protest, like, um, the, you know, this exorbitant price of, like, the only AIDS medication that was available at the time. It's like, you can't break into the New York Stock Exchange anymore. You would, like, you would be shot. Like, and I, I, like I'm not, like, I don't think I'm being facetious, to, like, to say that. And so there are all, like, in ways, like, it can feel like there are so many more, like, avenues of, with, like, social media or, like, you know, QR codes or, like, whatever, like, tactics you may have. But there are also a lot of, like, possibilities that have been, like, shut off by law enforcement. And that I think that this is something that a lot of activists are having a hard time sort of responding to now. Of, like, we all know that, like, you know, the rally with, you know, a bunch of speakers at, you know, at the podium in Foley Square, like, doesn't really do anything. But like what does, and that's like I feel like the A one question that like activists are confronting today, and that I imagine you're confronting a lot, you know, with C four A. Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think that's the why creativity is required. Right? Yeah. It's like the the world keeps moving. Yeah. And, and uh, one of my friends, Larry Bogat, put it like this: like you're in a dance, and like you might have this amazing move, but after that, if you don't have any other moves, like the opposition's are going to dance circles around you. Like you have to keep coming up with new dance moves. So. Yeah. So, Steve, can, can I ask you just to extend that thought a little further? Why why must, in order for it to work, why do advocacy and creativity, why must they be joined together? So, advocacy is stale, right? Like, the more you repeat an action, I think the less effective it gets. Mm-hmm. Um, other conditions have to change or something to, to, to sort of work after it's been repeated over and over again. Um, the, the environment changes. 
And then also, you know, um, like, creativity is part of everyone's life, right? So if you make activism, it's really an artificial sort of um, way of thinking about your life. Like, activism is serious work that I do, and then my creative life is a separate thing that I do on the weekends when I, like, throw dinner parties, or I'm do the stuff in my garden, or like I'm a DJ or whatever, right? And those are completely different things. That is a recipe for burnout, right? Yeah. Where this is obligation and this is fun. And this is like life draining and this is life giving. So um, our, we're complete human beings, right? And be part of being a human being and being creative. Like we talk to so many people like, well, I'm not, a, I'm not an artist, I'm not creative. Yeah, you are. Like, you may not have a art degree, you might not be a capital A artist, but creativity is part of everyone's life, right? And so, to allow for that to be brought back together, um, I mean, who benefits when we separate those, right? When we separate um, the serious work of getting things done, and effect, the outcomes of activism, and the creative sort of exploratory emotional life that we have. That doesn't, it's not an effective way to run a campaign, and it also totally depletes the people that are in it. Um, it only benefits people in power, right? So, um, so when you start to allow people to bring those things together, they not only come up with innovative tactics, but the, 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 the work that they're doing becomes like life-sustaining, you know? Which reminds me of your work, Bob Gordon, because there is like a, like, a sense of like humor and yeah. of like you know like playfulness to it that I think life and death stuff about very life and death stuff <laughs> which yeah. is like you know may seem like very kind of counterintuitive to a lot of people but like you know in my you know work on like you know Grand Fury and Act Up it's like that is what sustained the movement for such a long time was like that you know joyfulness that sexiness like in the face of something really deadly. Sure, I mean I think that advocacy should be fun. You know, that advocacy is to be part of a community. Uh, road crashes destroy families. But we are here as a community uh, with each other uh, protesting, advocating for safer streets against the status quo that the streets are for cars and the streets should be dangerous just because. And, and that's terrible. You know, I was listening to Peter Norton in the other talk. He wrote this great book, uh, Fighting Traffic. And he describes how 100 years ago, cars started to do a, a new social construction for our streets. And we normalize these terrible things that kids cannot play anymore in the streets. Mm -hmm. And we normalize that you have to be careful as a pedestrian. And you were talking, Jack, about um, blaming the victims. You know, right. who deserves this? I mean, if, if I got hit by a car, uh, it was my fault or it was a systematic, messed up problem that, that, that I cannot walk with freedom, I cannot bike with freedom. So yeah, that's, that's when uh, art, you were asking Rebecca, like, what, what is artistic activism? I think that artistic activism is a fun and great way to challenge the status quo, to challenge people in power to protest, and I think that the best way to describe uh, artistic activism is with, with examples, and the, the song you were listening, like, or was entering to this uh, room is a song that Bob Dylan and Jay Jacobs uh, wrote uh, 60 years ago, but they never recorded the, the song, so, so uh, during the pandemic I told my father, like, uh, nobody knows the melody of this song, nobody knows how this song goes, we, we, we only know the lyrics of this song, uh, of Bob Dylan and Jay Jacobs, uh, protesting against uh, Robert Moses, and um, so my father, a, a huge fan of Bob Dylan, and, and he plays guitar, he composed a song, and we recorded the song, and that's the song you listen at the beginning of, of, this, of this session, and, and, and here we are, like 60, 60 years after Bob Dylan and J.J. Cox were fighting right here in New York City, against Robert Moses, no? and, and I, I just bought this merchandise from <laughs> Transportation and America, you know? And, and so it's, 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 it's a 100 years failed experiment of, of doing this and, 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 and we need art to combat this terrible messed up system and, and to know that kids can play in the streets, that we can walk safely, that we can do, you know, and, and, and that's when, when I started 
doing this thing with a piatonito I have here, my, my mask. Uh, yeah, who knows uh, Mexican Lucha Libre here? Cool. So, so yeah, I, I did that. Like, instead of being in a ring fighting, go up to the streets and fight against cars. I didn't know I was doing like artistic performance things in the street. That I was just like doing it because it was fun. And to be honest, I was like really nervous going out to the streets. Like, this is like, probably foolish or cringy like, to be doing a mask in the streets. And, but uh, fortunately, I had like a great community. And my best friend, he doesn't have any filters, no shame. So he, gave me, he also uses a mask and go to the streets. And, and that's how we started like this fun way and, and, and cheap way. I only bought a mask and it was like. <laughs> Ten dollars in Mexico City, and ask and a cape, and just walk to the streets to, to do like. Okay, Jorge, can you take us through that process from like the light bulb moment? Uh, I should put on a luchador mask and a cape, and I should go out into the streets and be the cape crusader for the next dream, right? From that light bulb moment to to doing it, like take us through the mental process and any other steps you took, and and then any other. I don't know. Did you make mistakes? Did you revise along as you went along the way? Um, take us through, through those early days um, sure, uh, from, yeah, from idea to, to action. Yeah, I mean, this was exactly 10 years ago, the fall of 2012. And I was already a pedestrian advocate. I was part of the first pedestrian advocacy group in, in, in all Mexico. And we used to paint sidewalks and to paint crosswalks without any permits of the authorities. You know, mm -hmm. just like a real urbanism, like if the authorities is not gonna, not gonna do the infrastructure for us, we the people are gonna go out there and paint with our own money, with our own hands, the crosswalks and byways that we want to see in our city. And and, and then I was like thinking like, we can do this more creatively, you know, and, and they were thinking about yeah, creating our advocacy. So creative comes when you join like, two different things into one, you know, like lucha libre and pedestrian advocacy. All right. So, I went with my best friend actually to the Lucha Libre Arena to watch a match. And when I was watching, I was like, it would be great if a luchador is in the streets, like protecting pedestrians. And, you know, and I was like, yeah, I, I will hire one of those guys and, and tell them to go to the streets, but I, I don't have money to hire one of them. So, so why not? I, I, let's do it. Like, I can, you know, let's buy a mask outside and let's go to the streets. It's interesting what you're saying, Jorge, because it somewhat reminds me of like the creative process of like the crew of graphic designers that I wrote about. Like they didn't when they were first starting off, they didn't conceptualize of themselves as like artists making art in the service of activism. It was much more of like an organic process of like, oh, there's a problem. No one's talking about the AIDS crisis at any level of government or in the media. We need to like fix this. Well, the six of us in this room together just happen to all be like graphic designers, so let's make a poster about it. It was this very kind of like, oh, like these are the things that we know how to do. This could possibly be effective. Like, let's go for it. Like, they didn't say like, oh, like let's go out and be artists and let's learn these skills. They were very much invested in doing like things with this, the tools that they already have, and also the specific outcome, right? Yeah, like they're they're. With a lot of those posters, it's like they're they're responding to something specific. They're trying yeah. to get some kind of reaction, right? And know when you know exactly what you want to do, which is not hard, it just takes a little bit of stepping back and being you know analytical. But like, okay, in six months, this is where we want to be. Mm -hmm. Then you can start thinking like all the creative different ways you can get there, right? Uh, but if it's like fix the AIDS crisis, right? That's daunting and like that stifles creativity. And so the, the having, I mean, I think with the AIDS crisis, there was this urgency um, because it was so many people were dying, it would seem to be so sudden too that um, they knew there were real targets that were really clear. Um, and I think that's a really key piece that a lot of artist types kind of resist, right? And sometimes people working with artists, like, oh, we don't want to tell you what to do. But actually, like, I'll just make a star work that'll solve this problem. It's like too that's too big and it's too difficult. Right, right. Because they do think that like the difference between like artistic activism and like the kind of art that you see in a museum is that like artistic activism does have a more like predetermined outcome that it wants to elicit absolutely. Yeah. Whereas like art in a museum is supposed to be this more not that artistic activism can't be multidimensional, but like it's supposed to be this more like contemplative environment. The kind of the thing that it wants you to see or the thing that it wants you to do after having seen it for a museum piece isn't as clear. Whereas it's because it's rich people run the museum. It's <laughs> 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 a different topic. <laughs> 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 so, 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 so,
So, so Steve, can you talk a little bit more about either elements that you see in, in Jorge's work as Piazza Vita um, and or in some of the work you described as Grand Fury, elements that make it successful artistic actors? So we've talked a little bit about <coughs> outcomes. Um, I mean, how do you break up the outcomes into smaller steps? Yeah. And, and, and also, if you could name some of these specific elements that help make um, make these actions successful, um, attention-seeking, changing minds. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, um, um, I mean, this is like a fun thing to do because you can always look at any successful movement and be like, all right, so how did this work as a lie, right? Mm -hmm. And, um, you know, a favorite example that's in the book is Rosa Parks, right? And, like, mm -hmm. we think of Rosa Parks as being, you know, the story that's told about her. But she was a very experienced activist, and, and there was a very deliberate moment when she was like, I want to get a picture of me on the bus, you know, with like this person sitting behind me. And words with photographers to make it happen, right? So, um, and that photo is like what told that story. So, um, so you can look back at something like Rosa Parks, dig a little deeper and be like, ah, okay, there's this thing of like creating an image of love story. Right. Um, with you, it's um, I think there's a few things, and I invite all of you to do this. I'm not the only one that can do it, right? But um, that there's a um, it's also very clear. Like you don't you barely need a caption for that picture, right? Like you're showing, hey, this is like this superhero that needs to defend us from cars. Mm -hmm. This is the problem, right? Um, that it's funny, right? So whenever you're talking about something difficult finding a way to attract people to it somehow, whether it's through design or through humor or through a story, whatever the case may be, but like you have to make people want to walk towards it instead of run away. Um, and then the other thing is that it's so, uh, that I, I find appealing from it is that it's, it would be very easy for someone to replicate. And so like they don't even need the mask, right? Like they can just do it. And so it has this potential to not be a thing that you're the person, but that it can grow into this like larger movement, or you, like people can join you, or that they can take it on a different part of the city. I don't know if that's happened yet, but like to me, that's really exciting about the, the participatory potential. <coughs> oh no, sorry. I just wanted to mention that yeah, uh, before me, I was inspired by the for, former mayor of the and yeah, yeah, yeah. mm -hmm. he, he he fired all the corrupt transit policemen. He hired minds to control traffic. <laughs> and so it's very funny to see the minds like protecting pedestrians and you know, and, and they were not like uh, issuing tickets to the car drivers, they were like just like doing like a like, yeah, yeah. <laughs> city culture, city culture is in an artistic way, in a fun way, peaceful way, you know, and I think that I'm a radical pacifist, so yeah, never study violence in the street. We have enough violence, so yeah, let's let's be fun and if somebody is violent. This, this, I like that, and, 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 and yeah, because in my experience, like more than at least in Mexico City, because uh, people are very familiar with uh, Lucha Libre, Mexican Lucha Libre, so they, and more than 90% of the drivers, they are happy and, and they understand the message, and they have fun with me, you know? Of yeah. course, there's, there's always a percentage of people that are, are uh, they didn't have a good day, and, or, you know? <laughs> But never like escalate the violence, you know. Like that, ninety percent of people was enough to transmit a message, an important message for for, for the city. And yet, and I was also inspired by the first uh, actually mass pedestrian um, superhero uh, in Quito, Ecuador, the Captain Shu and his uh, pedestrian army of liberation on the sidewalk in uh, Quito, Ecuador. And then I was inspired about that. And then after me, by like, uh, twenty more. Uh, Pedestrian superheroes around Latin America, like fighting for safer streets. Yeah, it's, it's easy to replicate. It's easy to send a message and to have fun. Yeah. One thing I just want to add on to what you were saying, Steve, about like the kind of because it, it, you were kind of talking about like the ingredients of success for like artistic activism, and I think that one of the big ones that I noticed in my research is like the importance of having like a community that these artists are a part of, and that 
if you're making artistic activism, like even if not everybody is like involved in the actual production of that thing, it's important to have a community where you can kind of like disseminate that message. Or like in the case of ACT UP, like you can get this like mass of people like all holding the same poster or like all holding the same t-shirt. Like I really don't think that, and you, you know, you see it with like the images of the civil rights movement that you're talking about as well. Like yes, we have these iconic images of like Rosa Parks or the I Am A Man poster, but it's all coming out of this community that's able to facilitate I think that's a huge part of the success of it, and I really don't think that artistic activism works unless you are kind of enmeshed in that community, and the community feels like this work is representing them in a way, you know, that they feel empowered by. So speaking of, of community, Jen, you know, you made a point in your book, um, in a passage from It Was Vulgar, and it was beautiful. You make the point that grand theory changed the world, and yet its largest demonstration fielded only around five us about five thousand people. So, how can we understand how a small number of people made such a huge impact, and, and what did the art have to do with it? Ooh, I mean, I think like, most social movements are pretty small groups of people. Like, and it's a very different model than what we're doing today, or than what a lot of activists are doing today, where it's all about, like, numbers. It's all about, like, how many people can we get, you know, to this demonstration. And ACT UP wasn't really doing that. What they were doing instead was direct action. But, um, you know, ACT UP didn't stage, you know, rallies. They didn't really do marches either. Um, and direct action is a word that's really thrown around a lot today, but for ACT UP it had a very, very specific and particular meaning. Act Up's idea of direct action was going to the people in power and making them uncomfortable until they decided to do the right thing. And that's really how you get like small groups of people to, you know, make changes. Like you make it really uncomfortable for those in power to continue doing things the way that they have. Um, obviously, you know, there are many different ways that you can, you know, make those in power uncomfortable or sort of bend them to your will. Um, but you know. And you know that's sort of what we were talking about earlier. Like those methods are constantly changing. Yeah. And, and so, Jorge, I want to have a, sort of a follow-on question for you because Piazza Mito takes this concept of small numbers, big act, big impact, really um, to an extreme. You're a one-man show with occasional collaborators, and to me, it makes a major statement about empowerment and agency. So, you know, this is a very like, practical-minded question, but. What does the solo artistic activist need to get started and to keep going? What what can the solo artistic activist maybe accomplish that a larger a larger outfit might not be able to, or at least to launch? Sure. Um, to be honest, uh, I, I never feel felt like a solo um, advocate. Mm -hmm. I was always part of a community of road safety advocates. Mm -hmm. uh, as I told you, like painting sidewalks, painting. Uh, crosswalks, flyways, and then uh, and then I started the idea of Gatonito with my best friend. So yeah, it's always there's always community. But 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 you are right. Sometimes the media called me and, and they told me like we want you out of the streets and do an interview and, and then we want you to see pushing cars. And I was I mean, it was all by myself, you know. So it was like making these people feel like, right. Let's do it. We need to send a message and I have to do it by myself. Uh, let's go out to the streets, and, and some people love it, some people hated it, some people thought it was ridiculous. I, um, I, I told that to my family, like, yeah, some people uh, uh, call me out on the streets, like, yeah, that's ridiculous. But uh, my sister told me, like, yeah, it's ridiculous is the people that don't fight for their rights, you know? <laughs> ridiculous is to just uh, criticize another, you know? And then as, as long as you're not hurting anybody and you're respectful, and peaceful, I think you, you can do whatever you want in the streets. Like, why not like, do like a theoretical action in the streets? Uh, and, and yeah, and uh, yeah, for some reason, yeah, the, the first lesson in storytelling is like uh, the antagonist protagonist figure. You know, we always need like Batman versus the Joker, or uh, Spider Man versus Venom, or Jane Jacobs versus Robert Moser, you know, <laughs> it's powerful that antagonist protagonist theory, and for some reason humans like that storytelling technique. So yeah, it's like wrestling has survived for several years. Exactly. <laughs> There's the bad guy. Exactly. In, 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 
management with uh, and rules versus technicals, you know, the good guy guys versus the bad guys, you know, and, and that's a storytelling in, in, in action. And uh, what else? But it goes back to like really early theater. Yeah. You know, like wrestling has a history that goes back, I think, hundreds of years. Yes, of yeah. course, yeah. It's, 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 it's in our nature to tell stories as, as humans, you know, like if you read the book Homo, Homo sapiens by Yuval Harari. You can read that, yeah, it's, it's part of our humanity to know about these stories and to transmit messages with these storytelling techniques. But also, like, probably this is like very Western to have only one protagonist and one antagonist, you know, it's very individual and pretentious, you know, like, I think that the protagonist is also a community, you know, like, road safety and hope, like family for safe streets and community versus road crashes, you know, another way to. To, to, to transmit this technique of storytelling the community against the people in power, building more highways, you know? Uh, so yeah, there are different ways, and whatever works, let's do it. Yeah, I mean, the ultimate goal is to have zero uh, fatality, zero uh, street crashes on our streets, and we should try everything and to see what, what works, yeah. So, Steve, among other things, I understand that uh, the Center for Artistic Activism is a grant-making organization. So, so let, let's talk about a, a money, a, mm -hmm. you know, can be a third rail, but um, how, how does it help? Um, you know, what, what do you need it? Um, you know, what, what would you do with money? Um, yeah. Yeah. So, uh, I actually was on a call yesterday, we're like, we're not a great thing. Um, and because uh, we we give people money as a way so that they can say, go to the organization and be like, well, I already have this funded, so you know, like, it just moves things along. Um, and a lot of organizations are maybe hesitant to like start a space program, where <laughs> just one of the things we were talking to a group today. They're trying to um, make DC the 51st state, so they're launching Apollo 51, which is a mission to get a new star onto the flag. And so, <laughs> and it's really great. And we gave them like a thousand dollars to develop this project, and it's come along really well. And now we can like give them a little bit more money, so they can go back and say, "We try this. You have more money. You want to do more?" And build support, right? So the way that we use money and supporting projects is through to, to like bring these ideas into your organizations where if we went straight to them and said you should be doing this, they're like we're too busy. But if we say, hey, we're gonna give your so this person in your organization a fellowship to learn this stuff, and we also we're gonna give them five grand to do some projects, then it becomes it's like a way of sneaking into the uh, the structure of the organization and changing the organization. I have one, I have one more, one more third rail yeah. sort of question, and and that's about rage because it's such an important driver of activism. But we're also often told as activists that rage repels the people that you're trying that you're trying to bring to your side. Um, so so Jack, it, it seems to me that Grand Fury was really open about their rage, yeah. and so I'm wondering, you know, how did you how do you observe Grand Fury harnessing their rage? to really productive ends, and what was it about the way that they presented their rage that they were able to eventually bring the mainstream to their side? I do, well, I actually don't agree that we okay. very brought the mainstream to their side. Okay. I, 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 don't, I, I don't think that they did, and I don't think that ACT UP did, and I think that, but I think that ACT UP was still able to make like, like you know, huge changes for queer people and for people with AIDS, and I think it's because ACT UP was not afraid of being unpopular. It was something that the group would like very often tell themselves of like, we're not doing this to win the general support of the public. We're doing this to win very tangible, you know, drug, you know, basically medications, civil rights, you know, um, different classifications from the CDC for people with AIDS. And so this idea of being like, I think it's one of the benefits that a lot of activists, it's one of the benefits of being an activist group as opposed to being a politician. Like, if you're a politician, you really do have to stay, you know, um, you know, you have to make the public like you so that you can, you know, continue your job. If you're an activist, you don't really need widespread public support. You kind of just need a, de a small, dedicated group of people who want to accomplish the same end as you. And it's a really hard thing to internalize of, like, oh, like, you know, because everyone naturally wants to be liked. I think it's a very like natural human thing. It's a sort of, but 
but it can be kind of counterintuitive to, you know, getting the work done or sort of winning the things that, you know, your community needs. So, um, so, so thank you for the clarification. Sure. <laughs> <laughs> and I can say more about that if you want. Yeah, but. Yeah. Um, but, but Jorge, I, I think, um, you know, Piazza needs to provides a really potent counterpoint to the work of Grand Fury because, you know, you've created this character that is endearing mm -hmm. and comical. So how do you, you know, how does that, that in this deadly series, like, right, life and death, space, so how does being endearing and comical also convey this is an emergency? Sure, I would like to start with acknowledge that we need all the emotions and we need all the feelings in this drama. We need rage, we need sadness, we need fun, happiness, you know, everything. I mean, we have an ultimate goal and whatever works. You know, actually, my favorite music is very depressing. Um, <laughs> you can listen to Radiohead, Sigur Rós, like very depressing music. I also listen to very music with a lot of rage, you know, like rage against the machine, you know, and you win them, and, and you love to be there, and you're, yeah, let's, let's, uh, let's fight the politicians, let's destroy the system, you know, with a lot of anger, you know, I also love punk rock music, which, you know, like, if you have been a mosh pit, there's a lot of anger, you know, it's very artistic and there's a lot of anger, so, so all feelings work, you know, but that said, yeah, I, I think that, and, and Steve mentioned this, you know, if we want people uh, to be more optimistic and to and don't walk away and come to, to the, our movement, uh, uh, optimistic ways of doing advocacy works, you know, like, I think that um, people want to see the blue sky after the storm, People want to see that, that, that we have a hope and, and, and that we can have fun while we are fighting for our rights and that we can be part of a community, you know? When I turned 30 years old, it was more difficult to make friends, you know? Mm -hmm. But advocacy, it's a great way to still be part of a community and have friends, you know? I actually, I met my significant, uh, my significant other in, in this advocacy transportation. Uh, uh, group. So, so yeah, it's, it's, we are a community, we, we are a family, you know, that they're fighting for something and, and we have fun together and, 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 and yeah, that's a way, great way to uh, have more people on our side, to convince people, like to, doing persuasion techniques so, uh, then they know that there's hope after all this tragedy. So I think this, this is a great place to end because now we're going to turn the floor over to all of you. It's time for us to do a lot of the work that we've been talking about. And, and Steve is going to lead us now through the interactive portion of our program. Yeah, so, so um, don't be afraid. <laughs> I'm not going to make you come up here or anything. Uh, one thing I do want to give you all that is a piece of this green paper. Um, can you help me? This is the first part of the interaction here. Uh, yeah, I just need one of those pieces of paper. Um, and what you're going to do is take one sheet and um, make a silly hat. With it. Make a silly hat. Yeah. Um, however you like. It's not a common
is you can, right? So, so think of, you want to think of impossible things. First seven are possible, then the last three are, sorry, first seven are impossible, mm -hmm. the last three are possible. Does that, does that make sense? So well, we have to do the impossible ones first. You have to do the impossible ones first. Everyone with me? Yeah. Now, the other thing is you only get seven minutes to do the whole thing. Okay? Yeah. So, um, so that big sheet of big pad of paper. You look great. You look great. You look great. Okay. okay. So, um, I'm going to give you a big old piece of paper. Can you help me with a big piece of paper? And um, you're here before, right here, including you. You are here before. Make friends, learn each other's names. Uh, you are here before, right here. You are here You are here You are here
Oh, yeah. All right. All right. Um, I think it's practical. Just like gotten rid of that 
that energy. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, and we could still be realistic, but we have like removed all those mental I can't hurdles. It's true. Um, I did this with a huge group in Scotland that were working on Scottish independence. Um, and it, it, it was like 50 or 60 something people. And um, Listen if you can It's all about our neighborhood That you're trying to condemn We are not going to sit back And see your homes turn down So take your the highway And keep it out of town For 20 long years there's been A shadow hanging round And any day the bulldozers Will throw our houses down we're going to leave the shadows one and all for good. We don't want a super highway. We want a neighborhood. We will not be moved, but he, we will not be moved. We're fighting for our rights and we will not be moved. We are fighting for our rights from our head to our shoes. We are fighting for our homes and we are not going to lose. Young, and some of us are old, but no one of a light to be drowned out in the cold. Are we squatches in the city with we are living in? We will stand up for our rights or be scattered in the wind. <laughs> up and down Melbury, United Streets and Spring, Christie and Canal Street, you hear a voice a ring. From Elizabeth to Townsend, the Barry streets and more. We tried to save our streets from the super highway doom. We will not be moved, buddy. We will not be moved. We are fighting for our rights and we will not be moved. We are fighting for our rights from over here to our shoes. We are fighting for our homes and we are not going to do. From some highways or else of fancy stores, they may be forces to leave their homes and all the roofs behind and the willing houses projects, the reservation kind. It's time to make a stand, it's time to drive and say the heat never hoof of ours for a slam down in the grave. So hold up your banners and rise them to the wind. We stand here and fight, and fight until we win. We will not be moved, buddy, we will not be moved. We are fighting for our rights, and we will not be moved. We are fighting for our rights from our heads to our shoes. We are fighting for our homes, and we are not going to lose.